today we're going to be building this floating Jedi training remote. I'll be using Big Fred's Customs file for this project as it has many possible print and display options, including a version that is compatible with one of these magnetic levitation bases. Because of wanting to make this droid float in the future, I printed the completely split version so that I could FDM print the main frame and base and resin print all of the Greebly details. And there are a ton of Greeblies on this ball. I'll be using my Mars 4 Ultra for this project that was very kindly provided by Elegoo. I've been printing quite a few custom black series scale figures on this printer for myself at a 0.025 millimeter layer height, and they've been turning out incredible. I wanted to try printing all of the Greeblies at the lower layer height to see how they would turn out. There are literally over 80 individual pieces for the surface of this ball, and ideally with the lower layer height and the 9K resolution screen that this printer has, they would come off of the printer paint ready without me needing to do any sanding or post-processing work. And I have to say, these might be the best looking resin prints straight off of the printer that I've ever done before. I've resin printed hundreds, if not thousands of pieces, so I know where to look for layer and voxel lines, and these pieces came out as close to flawless as they could. I know for printing slightly larger and less detailed pieces like these, you might not consider using the lower layer height, and originally I didn't think it would make much of a difference, but it really, it really does. Even where there is maybe a hint of a layer line because of the orientation of a piece, because each layer is half of the thickness compared to normal, that line is barely visible. I might be sticking it to a 0.025 millimeter layer height from now on, unless it's some ginormous piece that takes up the entire build volume, because the one dial side is that it takes twice as long to print. I think it is worth it though, especially since it's going to save me time in the future with not needing to do any post-processing on these pieces. It would be cool to maybe see adaptive layer height settings options come to the resin printing world. You could keep a more standard 0.05 millimeter layer height for the majority of the model, but anywhere where those layers might become more visible, start to lower the layer height for the most optimal results. Once I had all of the detail pieces printed, cleaned, and cured, it was on to start to assemble the ball. Now with the levitating version, something that you need to be conscious of is its weight. The base is rated for 500 grams, and I did weigh all of the pieces to see how close I was to that maximum, which thankfully I was well under. But this is the point in my build where the wonderful Andrew's print shop on Instagram probably saved this entire project. He'd just tried to make one of his own, and it very sadly didn't float. He had some amazing tips and ideas on how to possibly fix that though, so I reprinted these ultra light eyes for the top half of the ball, as well as dremeled out portions of the top frame to try and make it lighter. The theory is that the ball is almost too perfectly balanced, so unless you purposefully counterweigh it, it will just try to tip itself over. Before we can consider putting any of this ball together, we first need to glue in the magnet for the base so that it actually will float. Just make sure whatever adhesive that you're using for this is very, very strong because you absolutely never want this magnet to be able to detach. Once the magnet adhesive had set, it was onto starting to assemble this ball. I decided to use these side panel pieces to help me glue the top and bottom halves of the ball together, not only because it was going to help me line everything up appropriately, but it also just seemed a lot easier than trying to run a super thin line of adhesive along the edges and hope that that stuck, and I do think this went a whole lot smoother than if I'd tried to do it that way, especially since I knew that I would be using something to hide that seam and any possible gaps, and also just generally strengthen the two pieces together there more. So as you saw, very obviously labeled, I decided to use my extra thick resin filler, which is just UV printer resin mixed in with a whole lot of fumed silica powder. There's really not a recipe for it other than mix in as much fumed silica until you get the consistency you want. I did end up sanding that resin down before starting to add all of these greeblies, which there are so many pieces. Obviously, I wanted to print everything separately so that all of the individual pieces had the greatest chance of printing at the highest resolution possible so that all of the details on this ball looked amazing. But of course the downside to that is that you have an absurd amount of very small pieces that you need to worry about. I decided to glue on all of the Greeblies other than the small gray panels because I wanted everything to be in one piece already so that it would all get the exact same paint job. I decided to leave the gray panels off so that I could paint them easier. Ideally I probably would have tried to do that with the central panels as well, but I needed those on the ball 
small so that I could actually glue the two halves together. I also went a bit further and went around any of the seams around the eyes and stuff with some resin in a fine nose bottle to make everything look like it was one piece. And now it is on to my favorite part, painting. Well, priming first. I decided to use a gray primer for this just because I thought the underpainting undertone of the gray would probably work the best. I didn't want to go with white because it was probably going to look too stark with all of these pieces. So I primed the main ball, all of the small gray side pieces, as well as the top and bottom agreeably with that gray primer. But the inner part on the larger eyes, I sprayed with this gloss black lacquer because I knew I wanted to use some chrome paint on these. They are very perfectly shiny metallic. I debated slightly whether to do the chrome or more of the Beskar metallic look, but I figured since this prop was from the 70s, it probably was a lot more chrome in color. But back to painting the main ball, I just so happened to have the perfect colors for this project because I ended up stocking up on paints to make a model of Ahsoka's T6 shuttle and it's basically the same color as this Jedi training remote. For the side panels, I decided to go with a Tamiya paint color because I knew I was going to need something that I could brush on super easily later as well as be able to thin it down so that I could more easily airbrush all of these small panels. And of course, have it be the exact same color still. Painting the gray on these panels was not as bad as I thought since they are raised as long as you have a fairly steady hand and a decent brush It goes pretty smoothly. I suppose I could have masked all of these off and airbrushed it as well But I couldn't be bothered hand painting was good enough for me today for the red of the eyes I mixed these two colors together because the red for this area is Kind of hard to tell exactly the tone that it might be there is this one really nice picture of the actual Training remote prop and the red in this picture looks significantly different compared to what it looks like in the film, which obviously could be due to lighting, but it also could be due to age. Red it tends to be one of the worst light fast pigments that you can use, so the photo could just be what that prop and the red paint on it looks like now almost 50 years later. Either way, I tried to hit a color somewhere in the middle between those two examples. The last bit of hand painting on this ball was on these vent pieces as well as the tops of these barrel parts. This was with a slightly darker gray than the gray used on any of the panel pieces. Speaking of the gray panels, I decided to go ahead and glue all 24 of the smaller separate panel pieces onto the ball so that when we start the weathering process, it takes on all of the same effect as the rest of the sphere. For the weathering, I mixed some black wash with extra brown paint, extra water, and airbrushed that all over the ball in sections. This is easily my favorite way to weather props. It looks so natural, it's really fast and foolproof. You will see me spray extra water from time to time if I feel like the weathering and spraying of the area maybe got a bit too intense. But this just gives a really natural looking weathering across an entire prop. I will go back into sections that I feel like need more weathering, but I start out by doing a pass over the entire prop and then specifically for this prop, the gray panels had very distinct muddy weathering that looked exactly like what you see here with the airbrushing onto the pieces, like that spattering that you get when you hold the airbrush too close and it starts to develop those darker rings of paint where the air from the airbrush is pushing the paint out to pool in sections. I don't know, it looked perfect, so I'm really happy with that. And then I went in with this very orange toned wash to the upper and lower portions of the ball because from all the reference, they looked extra rusty compared to the rest of the weathering. This file does have printable lenses for the eyes, but for ease and to keep the weight down, I decided to use some mylar for them instead. I got my Cricut to cut out the two size circles that I would need for the large and small eyes, which it barely did. It took like four passes, but thankfully I did get it to work. But then it was just gluing on those mylar lenses to the backs of the large eyes and then the inner portion of the small eyes. 
And the final step for this ball assembly is gluing in the inner portion of the large eyes to the rest of the training remote. Now the ball itself is finished, but this thing isn't going to be able to float without a proper base. The one designed to fit the magnetic levitation mechanism looks like the hollow chest table, which is super cool. So I started off by priming all of the pieces for it in a gloss black because this is a very gunmetal colored table. You're going to want to start out with a nice glossy base so that the metallic paint really pops. For the top section of the base that is supposed to look like the top of the hollow chest table, I had my Cricut cut me out a custom stencil so that I could just apply that onto the top, have the design fit on there perfectly, as well as being able to give myself super sharp lines with this mask. This was sprayed with the same metallic color that the rest of the base was painted in. And once the paint had dried, I could go ahead and remove all of these stencil parts. And with that, we can start assembling the magnetic levitation portion into this base. There's a hole cut into the back of the side portions so that you can feed the power cord connector through. The main mechanism fits into the bottom section and then the top part just clicks on. You could glue this together, but I just decided to leave everything sitting. And here is the finished floating Jedi training remote. I hope you enjoyed seeing the building process of this project. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in my next video.